Welcome to Investigate Joe Rogan, the podcast where I investigate claims made on the Joe Rogan experience. Today I will be investigating 9-11, <clears throat> episode 9-11, with Alex Jones and Eddie Bravo. I am doing this old episode because I find it to be a very entertaining episode, and there wasn't really anything immediately after the Forrest Galante episode that I wanted to do, so here we are. Episode 9-11 starts off with them talking about how the legacy media is dying. And they're right, but I thought I would give some sort of updated numbers uh, since two years have passed since this episode came out. And current ratings for televised news are actually even worse than the numbers Alex Jones throws out on this episode. So according to Nielsen Media Research, CNN recently hit a three-year ratings low of 643,000 average viewers from 9 to 11 p.m. And this was during the week of November 25th to December 1st, which really should have been a, a pretty hype news cycle because the, the Trump impeachment proceedings were going on. So you'd think this would be a great week for televised news. MSNBC does better, averaging 1.3 million. And then Fox News, of course, is the biggest uh, TV news, and they average about 2.2 million viewers for this time slot. And Alex Jones is right about this. Uh, televised news is is pretty much on life support at this point. You know, these are these are very low numbers. One other small thing I'd like to mention before really getting into it here is the video they bring up of the schizophrenic dude trying to convert the lions to Christianity, or he just hops into the enclosure with his Bible. What they don't say in the episode, and I think deserves to be mentioned, is that luckily he actually lived. The guy had to go to a hospital, but he survived this <laughs> encounter. It's truly a modern day David in the lion's den. And I think it seems a bit sad if you, if you leave that part out, and they didn't mention it in the episode. So I thought I'd let you guys know. But that's that's it for for animals and attacks and things. The rest of this the rest of this is serious business. So the first the first thing they get into is of course Hillary. And Alex Jones says that the Vatican, China, and the Saudis all funded Hillary. And these three things have varying levels of plausibility. The idea that the Vatican funded Hillary's presidential campaign seems to come from this one book called The Dictator Pope, but the book doesn't have any sort of a source for this claim, and it was not written by a Vatican insider or even by somebody with access to the Vatican. It was just written by an outside historian. So there's no real reason to think that it's true. I mean. It could have just been totally made up on the spot. There's no evidence. The much more plausible one is China. So the, in the WikiLeaks emails, there are some that show that Hillary probably met with the Chinese ambassador during her campaign. Now, this is not actually a suspicious thing. Candidates frequently meet with foreign ambassadors and foreign leaders and things like that. But I thought I would mention it uh, just in the sake of fairness, because if a leaked email came out that Trump had a off-the-record uh, meeting with the Chinese ambassador during his campaign, you know, I'm sure Democrats would be all over it and claim conspiracy. So I thought I would bring it up, even though it's not actually that suspicious. Also, because it's kind of funny, in the email, one of Hillary's like staffers writes, quote, I'm happy to make some chili and cornbread by the fire, in reference to their meeting with the Chinese ambassador. And I just found the mental image of Hillary and her campaign team sitting around like a comfy, roaring fire, with some like stone-faced 
like Chinese Communist Party member in like a black suit eating chili and cornbread to be really funny for some reason. Really like something out of out of Veep. And there are, there are other Chinese connections from before her campaign while she was Secretary of State. In 2011, Bill Clinton got half a million from, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, Hui Tao CEO Forum as a speaking fee, which I think at this point everyone knows that these speaking fees are basically just bribes. And then in 2013, Rillin Enterprises, which is a company owned by a Chinese member of parliament, donated $2 million to the Clinton Foundation. Now, while she was Secretary of State, of course, she was not running the Clinton Foundation, but I mean, there's been a lot of shadiness to do with that. And while Bill Clinton was president, he had to deal with so-called Chinagate, which were investigations into whether or not China secretly funded his 1996 presidential campaign. And it never found a smoking gun. Basically, congressional Republicans said, oh, you know, he did do it. And then congressional Democrats said that he didn't. However, there are many suspicious things about the entire investigation. First of all, an independent council was never created. Then, 94 people either refused to be questioned, pled the Fifth Amendment, or left the country to avoid having to testify about this whole thing. Then, some FBI agents also testified before Congress in 1999 that Justice Department prosecutors impeded their inquiry and basically stonewalled their investigation. So the whole thing is very suspicious. So I find the idea that China could have funded Hillary in some way to be plausible, even if there is no hard evidence. So I'll kind of give Alex Jones that one. And then the idea that the Saudis funded Hillary, that idea comes from one news story that was published by the official Jordan News Agency, which is called Petra News. And they, they put it up on their website, and then Infowars and all these other sites ran with it. And the story said that a Saudi prince had admitted to them that they funded 20% of Hillary's campaign. But then they took down the story and said that like hackers had broke into their website and posted it. But by this point, it was too late. Infowars and everyone had already like put out the story. So it kind of made the rounds on the internet. So you could say that they just got blackmailed and had to take it down. It seems suspicious. I will admit that it seems suspicious. But the Saudi prince in question never said anything later about this. Now you could say, oh, he got, he got blackmailed too. They shut the whole thing down. But if he wanted to be a whistleblower, why did he only tell the official news agency of Jordan? Why wouldn't he tell like Fox News or like CNN or some major American news organization? Because he was probably trying to leak it if he was a whistleblower, if this was real. He would be trying to leak it to Americans because that's who the information would be relevant to. So it doesn't really make any sense to me that this is the only source he would tell. So I will admit that it seems suspicious, but honestly, I don't really buy into this. What is confirmed is that the Saudis did donate to the Clinton Foundation before and after Hillary's term as Secretary of State, though they did not donate during. So this that is confirmed. So I don't think you really need to rely on this possibly fake news story from Jordan. You can just look at this and say, well, isn't that pretty shady just on its own? I mean, the Clinton Foundation, I think everyone sort of recognizes was kind of a scam at this point. So they, 
they talk about the the WikiLeaks Hillary emails more, and Alex Jones says that the hack on Hillary's email server was done by U.S. intelligence, like the C, like some patriots he says in the CIA, like went rogue and and did it on their own, and U.S. intelligence says the hack was done by Russia. And then WikiLeaks says the hack was not done by Russia and will not say who it was. So honestly, who knows who did it? Can you can you trust U.S. intelligence on this one? Are they a trustworthy source? Can you really trust WikiLeaks? I really don't think that this is something that the general public can even know about. It's just sort of lost in the shadows. Maybe in like 40 years, the actual hacker will come out once everyone involved is long dead and like nobody really cares anymore but it will be a cool like future wikipedia page you'll be like oh man they did it and people didn't know during the election that's crazy so maybe we have that to look forward to in the future but some these sorts of things with alex jones he he claims to have like insider sources which you know obviously you can't verify so you really just can't know if he's telling the truth or not. They talk more about the leaked emails, and Alex Jones, of course, claims that there are various coded messages in the emails that are references to pedophilia. But the thing is, if you read the actual emails and not just the like snippets that Alex Jones quotes, they really just aren't that suspicious. For instance, the kids in the hot tub email that he points to as evidence. If you look at it in context, it's probably nothing. It was sent by Tamara Lozado, who is the grandmother of the kids in mention. And it's about a party of like ex-coworkers who worked with Podesta and stuff. And then according to the emails, Podesta wasn't even there. He had a prior engagement and he couldn't even go. So that's just wrong right off the bat. And then here's the whole email. I'm just going to read the whole thing and then you can decide whether it's suspicious in context or not. With enormous gratitude to advanced man extraordinaire Haber, I am popping up again to share our excitement about the reprise of our gang's visit to the farm in Lovettsville. And I thought I'd share a couple more notes. We plan to heat the pool, so a swim is a possibility. Bonnie will be Uber service to transport Ruby, Emerson, and Maeve Lozado, 11, 9, and almost 7. You'll have some further entertainment, and they will be in that pool for sure. And with the forecast showing prospects of some sun and a cooler temperature of lower 60s, I suggest you bring sweaters of, of whatever attire. That's a typo on her part, not mine. I suggest you bring sweaters of whatever attire will, ena will enable us to use our outdoor table with a pergola overhead so we dine al fresco and ideally not al chillo. She ends with a joke there. Now, is this really that suspicious? Does this come across as a veiled reference to child sex slaves? Or does it just sound like a grandma talking about how her grandkids are going to be being silly in a pool. I think it is an enormous stretch to think that this comes across as some highly suspicious, eyes wide shut type party that's going on. Now, another example of how things can seem suspicious out of context is Obama's supposed purchase of $65,000 worth of hot dogs, which Alex Jones says is really $65,000 worth of gay prostitutes. So to begin with, there's no evidence that Obama spent $65,000 on hot dogs or, or gay sex or whatever. The origin of this is a WikiLeaks email from a guy named Fred Burton, who was working at Stratfor, which is a private intelligence company that advises corporations and government agencies and whatever. And he wrote, 
I think Obama spent about $65,000 of the taxpayers' money flying in pizza slash dogs from Chicago for a private party at the White House not long ago. Assume we are using the same channels. Now, does this come across as a hidden reference to a gay orgy at the White House? Or does it just come across as like a typical boomer joke about like the government wasting money? This is just what like boomer emails sound like. It's just, <laughs> it's just not that suspicious when you read the actual email. I mean, why would this guy even know about a secret gay Obama orgy? He's just, he's just some dude who works for some like Austin intelligence company. Now I'm not saying that there is nothing pedo going on in the government and that there is no like secret cabal of pedos. I mean, just look at what happened to poor Jeffrey Epstein and his very tragic and not suspicious at all suicide. Uh, obviously there is something going on, but when you use like poor evidence like these emails to make your point, you make the whole conspiracy seem ridiculous when in reality it's not that ridiculous. You turn people off from the whole idea when you when you bring up stuff like these emails and the hot dogs or whatever. Alex Jones's uh, thing he said about Barney Frank is another example of this. So Alex Jones says that he was caught uh, running like a pedo thing out of his apartment, and then he he threatened to expose other members of Congress, and so the whole thing got shut down. What really happened was Barney Frank uh, was dating a male prostitute and like letting him live in his apartment, and then his boyfriend uh, just started like running his business out of his apartment. So there were dudes coming in and coming out, and then when he got caught, he he claimed that he didn't know it was happening, but his boyfriend said that he did. Now, I mean, I I don't buy that at all. Like, really, Frank, you didn't know <laughs> that a gay brothel was being run out of your apartment? How do you not notice something that like that? So I do think there is a bit of a conspiracy there. I mean, he's obviously lying, but there's nothing there's nothing actually pedo involved. There's there's no evidence that there was at least. Um, Alex Jones also connects his whole general pedo conspiracy to the Vatican, and he said that 30% of priests are pedophiles. Now, the highest real number you'll find is 5%, which is obviously extremely bad, but it's also way different than 30%. Sexual assault is said to be the most underreported crime, so it is possible that the real number is way higher than 5%, but 30% is a real stretch. He also says that the the former pope, Pope Benedict, uh, resigned because he was blackmailed by the current pope, Pope Francis. Now, there is sort of some evidence for this. The Italian newspaper La, La Repubblica reported that Pope Benedict resigned the day after he got a report about the, um, those prelates, which is like a, a position in the Vatican, who were being blackmailed by outside sources because uh, they were doing gay stuff, banging dudes, going to gay bars. And that 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 is confirmed. That really did happen. So then, that is quite the suspicious time to resign. Resigning right after finding out about a scandal where other people got blackmailed. He has claimed that he was not blackmailed. But... Really, a pope resigning is super unusual. Before he did it, it had not happened for over 700 years. 
So this, this is circumstantial evidence, and there's no evidence beyond this, but it, it's pretty shady to me. What I don't, I don't know where Alex Jones is getting this idea that Pope Francis had anything to do with it, though. I couldn't find anything about that. And then Alex Jones also points to this big police operation where about 700 people were arrested in California as more evidence for a, a big pedo network. And he says, you know, that this was Trump behind this and Trump is, is rolling up all these, all these pedos. And this, this was called Operation Reclaim and Rebuild. And while there is no evidence that Trump had anything to do with it, there is something sort of suspicious about it to me. Because if you go on the internet and look for information about Operation Reclaim and Rebuild, no major news network picked up this story. It's all like local California news and like police reports. You really cannot find very much information about it at all. I would think that something that involved 700 arrests would be a major news story, but there's really very little information available about it. And then the last thing I'll mention in this episode is uh, his claim that Hillary tried to steal the election via hacking into voting machines. And this is something, you know, Trump was obviously very paranoid about voter fraud in the lead up to the election. But when he won, his own voter fraud investigation turned up nothing. There's no evidence that Hillary tried to hack the election. I think people sort of like confuse this with uh, the rigged Democratic primary where they sort of screwed Bernie over. But that that's a separate thing. I just feel like there's enough like confirmed shady things about the Clintons. You don't really need to resort to un, unconfirmed things like this if you want to make them look bad. So that is that is where I will end this episode. But this is far from over. Episode 911 of the Joe Rogan Experience is so deep so full of content, so full of unverifiable, powerful rants from Alex Jones that it is going to take me multiple episodes to cover it all. So get ready. This is not over yet. <laughs>